Well, amen. And amen. It's good to see everybody. And as you can see, Pastor Charlie's with us today here in Vermont. It's good to have all of the family gathered together. And I'd like to ask Pastor Charlie, if he would, to open us up in prayer. And today we'll begin by discussing some of what we've already seen and learned. And I pray today will be a special blessing as we go from a lot of the teaching that has made us prepared, today we shift and we begin to work on the practice. So let's begin with prayer. Pastor Charlie, yeah. would you pray with us? Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible opportunity to come together across the oceans, to come together, Father, to learn from your word, from the teaching of your word, Father, how to be missionaries, to apply the word. Uh, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for the assembly in India. And we ask you, Lord, to bless their hearts, open their eyes so they see better, so I see better, so Pastor Jeff can share clearer, Father, what we want to hear from you today. In the most precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers, let me ask you, and uh, I'm not going to call you by name again, just to try to enhance our safety. So if you would, as you feel most comfortable and led, would you share, let, let's take 15 or 20 minutes and just walk through some of what God has been showing you. And if there are questions, let's also share those with one another. And I pray be blessed as God reveals to all of us what he would have for us going forward. So as a group, uh, if you would, tell us what, what's been amongst the blessings or questions that you have up to this point as we get ready to go into session number four. Uh, in my side, uh, there is no question, but I got it the new sentence and new idea that I really uh, appreciating by that hearing the sentence. It's very uh, essential for us. The referential language there's, there are two commission, commission language and the referential language. It's very important, the, the sharing the word of God. We must know that, the things. That is the referential language is that the fact and true. There is no emotion. That is much said that true and fact, the things. And the two things is commission language. Is it a heart and love? It's much come from that. The, the things is I learned, the, which is you shared us yesterday that video. The, the ma three major part also really is it very uh, essential. The finding the reality. Now, it is what I have seen the preacher and uh, servant of God, they always uh, speaking. What? In their mind, they are not finding the reality things. They are talking here and there, but not come in that reality. Uh, reality. They are not trying to find out the reality things. So exact what is God, what Jesus wants to say, what God wants to say, that points people are not finding. That's also very important. And describing the restoration one uh, uh, two number and three number is the following they reproduce that also very important in my side really by watching i learned that uh, which is recent the yesterday in man that is very uh, good for me i really learned but when i have god is not if we think that it's not easy it's very hard if we think one side. Then one side, is it when people are thinking uh, very edgy? But reality uh, thing is that yesterday I got it, which is for me very hard to find out the reality. When I hear the, that in the video, really it is very useful for me. Thank you, Pastor. That's my little one yesterday. Very good. Any others? 
So what are the things that we do? Everything that we do according to the word of God. And even the classes are, you know, really uh, fantastic. And even today I was uh, talking to them regarding some of the practical things which they have to know when they are in the mission field. Because uh, in India, <laughs> we have different kinds of cultures. One culture might be different from another culture. Even in South India, from my side, when I go to their place in Northeast, their culture, even eating, even their talk, the greetings, the languages, and everything is different. So uh, today, even uh, I also had a very nice session with the brothers, and uh, I come to know that uh, they are not only they, we all are very happy and we are eagerly waiting for to hear from you again. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, let me tell you a little bit about where we are going today. In session number four, we will focus on the strategy that you can take with you when you bring the word of God on mission. And as was shared, we know that even in this small group, there are a number of different cultures that we bring the word and our mission goes into. Many different cultures, even with our small gathering here, there are very different cultures. One of the things that I pray that you and I can understand and share is that the one word of God is the answer and the solution in every culture in the world. We may come from different lands and different languages, but we all come under one Lord and one biblical love. And this is why our training is in part so important, because I have heard, even coming out of India, oh, Pastor Jeff, you don't understand. We have different cultures here. You'll learn the hard way about the different cultures. I've heard people tell me that about Africa. I've heard people tell me that about Vermont. And it is true, our cultures are very different. And it's true that there is potential for great damage if people are not sensitive to the different cultures. But what is not true is that you have to change the word of God to fit in any culture. No. The word of God is the word of God, and it is over any and all cultures. Our place is to bring the word of God, as Jesus said, to proclaim the good news to all the nations. He doesn't say proclaim different types of good news to different cultures and nations. He said, the gospel, one truth in love, by understanding, as we've done in session number one, the role of God's word in all of our missions and all of our ministries. And then in session two, to understand the word of God as the word of God, to understand the sword of the spirit and its role and how it is put together for us. And then last time in session number three, to see how important it is to not only understand our sword, but know how to use it and why it is so important in the details, in the definitions. And we saw that if you don't use the word of God on mission to establish your definitions and the descriptions 
in your discipleship, we've seen that things get very bad very quickly. And so today in session four, what I pray we can do together is to see the strategy of how we personally bring the word of God on mission. And we will look at it through the context of biblical teaching about biblical application with the Bible itself. And once again, I want you to see, we will be learning from a sermon. Now, I've taken one sermon and I've broken it into pieces for us to see and discuss, see and discuss. But please notice as we go through this session that what you are seeing and what we are learning is coming from the very fruit of the lesson that we're learning. And please notice that what you're going to take in works in any culture, in any country, or in any community, because it is the Word of God helping us to understand the Word of God, the will of God, and the ways of God. Now, this time, I want you to take in, think about, and let us discuss. So we'll have just a few minutes of taking in, then we'll stop and we'll discuss. Then some more and so forth. This is how we will go. Let me begin again with a prayer and then bring the introduction of this time to you and ask you to prepare your mind and your hearts to have the Lord pour into you his preparation for your proclamation. Lord, I ask you now to steady our hearts, open up our understanding supernaturally, I pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart in the here and now and through this teaching be pleasing in your sight. May my brothers and or anyone else who in the future comes to this time of teaching, may they be edified and equipped. May the love and the light that you've put in us grow stronger and reach further because of your amazing grace and through your applied gospel. May we bring all of our heart and all of our passion to this time for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen and amen. Focusing well, me... in on Psalm 119, verse 105. Let me share with you the word, and then I'm going to share quite a bit with you today. So let's focus on the word, and then we'll unpack it together. It's God's word that says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, let me just ask you a few questions and then we'll use this verse as a springboard to develop this strategy of light. Again, this is God's word, your word. Whose word? God's word. God's word is what? It is a light. It is his light for our living. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Our feet are straight down. It's God's word that is here to help us with our here and now. Your feet are right where you are. And it's his word that will be a light, not a little lamp, but a light to our path. Our path is for our tomorrows. Do you see here, the, the intention of our Lord is that his word will serve as the small light for our here and now. And it will be the huge light, as I have here, a super duper light that will illuminate the path way down the road. His word is designed to be both 
the short-term here and now lamp for our here and now, and the super-duper light that will illuminate our long-term path. Now, like this light and like the little candle, if I blow out that candle, it will not serve me well in my here and now. In the same way that if we don't listen to and adhere and embrace and come under the authority and illuminating truth of God's word here today, it will not help us if we are ignorant to it or we push it away. In the same way, with all the potential of this lamp, this light, if I don't push the on button, it serves no purpose for my path if I don't use it. Now, if I use it, this has potential to go way down the path, but only if I use it. The same is true for you and me, brother and sister, and this is what we see, that if we don't use the light of the word, we will remain in the darkness of this world. It is God's word that is to serve as the lamp to our feet here today and the light for our path into all of our tomorrows. Do you see this in this one little verse? I pray that this verse will help you and me to embrace a call to a greater understanding and utilization of the light of our Lord, his word, as we continue to commit to show and tell the world the word, the will, and the ways of God. My prayer is that you see you need a strategy that comes at this process, this command, this commissioning, this contending with a handle on the word of God. And that's why today we're going to look at five components of the strategy of light that God intends for you and me. We're simply going to look at the source, light's source. Then we're going to look at light's structure. Then we're going to look at light's study. Then we're going to look at light's system of preparing for sharing and ultimately light's sharing. That we'll look at these five points today the source, the structure, the study, the system, and the sharing. All of this because it is in God's Word that is giving us this strategy for God's Word through God's Spirit amongst God's people. So here's our introduction. In some ways, you can see session one, session two, and session three, all building up to this place. We're now ready to go forward to put into practice the principles that we've learned. Let me ask you, have you, have you realized that God's word is not just the book that we read from in our worship service? on the Lord's day? Have you come to realize how important it is that we have a fuller biblical understanding of the role of the Bible in our mission and in our ministry? Because if the answer is yes, then what is about to follow will help you. It will guide you. Because what we're going to do is see how God intends for you to use and carry and represent his word on mission. People, Let me go now and take us to the second of the teaching videos. Now, perhaps you're one who would ask, why do I need to focus on, why this fixation on, why is there such a big deal being made about God's word? As I shared with you last week, You've got to come to understand the Word of God if you have any hope or intentions of understanding the God of the Word. They go together in a way that cannot be pulled apart. Let me show you how a gentleman named Odd Thomas put it and why he chooses to read the Bible. I pray that you will embrace this same perspective. Amen and amen. For some people, their experience with God is existential or their concept of God is made up. And I think that the Bible is 
really the only way that we can know God. The Bible explicitly points to Jesus. The Bible explicitly teaches us how to live, how to know God rightly, how to obey, how to become dependent on Him. The Bible is a huge, is a huge part of it. And that's really the, that's the starting point of experiencing God. Because if you leave it up to yourself, then who knows what you'll conjure up in your own mind. And I think as you begin to read the Bible, and the Holy Spirit opens up your heart and your mind, it's crazy, but this Bible changes you. It changes everything. You begin to see God for who He is. You begin to see how affectionate He is towards you. You begin to see how much He loves His people. You can't know that without the Bible. I used to hear people all the time tell me, well, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Well, how, how, do, how do we know that? How, how do we know that? Well, I just know. I just feel it. And that's cool. I mean, it's true. But for someone like me, I needed to know, how do you know that? And I think the Bible is explicitly clear. It tells you. The whole Bible, Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, points to Jesus. My purpose in life is to love God, love people, and bring Him glory. And I know that purpose because He tells me that in the Scriptures. Okay, so I pray like him. You say, well, it's about a personal relationship. And if I'm going to get to know the God that is in the Word, then I need to know the Word that is giving me everything to know about my God. That's the source of our light strategy. Okay, so here again, we're just getting rolling. But please see that it's the Bible that tells us that it's the Bible that will tell us everything that we need to know. And it's Jesus who substantiates. It's Jesus who proves the word of God to be the word of God, because he is the word of God. Now, for all of us, and again, in India, in Africa, in the Americas, it's the word of God that gives us everything we need to know. All of the truth of God that is needed is found in his word. All of the word points to the truth and love that is Christ, also called the word of God. So let us trust, let us share with people like you just saw that man. Share your testimony. Share the fact that it's the word of God that tells you to share your testimony. Share the truth that you've come to see and know from the word of God. I know in India, it is very similar to the U.S. where people have opinions. I think this. I feel that. There are many people even calling themselves Christians because they say they feel Jesus or they think this about Jesus, or the church told them that about Jesus, and they're wrong. They're wrong because they go against the word of God. There are people who eat a big meal right before they go to bed, and then they say in the night they had a dream about Jesus. Their dream was more from their food, not from heaven. We need to understand the truth at its source so that we can rightly determine what is true and what is not true. Let us go into the next piece and again, begin to see how personal this is and how it's for you to carry to every village, every city, every conversation, every discipleship group, every worship service regardless of where we are or when we are. Let me share with you now the next part. Let me now take you to a structure. 
because maybe you're like me. Maybe for a long time, you've heard people say things like, you need to get in the word. You, you, you need to get in your Bible. Well, I was one of those people who didn't understand what that meant. And people would bark at me, even laugh at me, but few people were willing to help me. And I personally, I have a sense of passion for helping people to really understand that you can go into God's word. And, and what I found is that when I came to understand how the Bible is structured, it was as though I literally was like, why didn't somebody just tell me that? Well, today I'm going to tell you that. And I say to you right now, let's take a closer look at the light. And I pray, help you to discover how to discover God's word, God's will, and God's way by simply getting an understanding of how the Bible is structured. So I'm going to do this by using a one, two, three approach. Literally, one, two, three. One Bible, two parts, and three types. Literally. And I want to show it to you. There's one Bible. It has two parts. And those parts are broken down into three types of writing. One Bible. Well, that one Bible, I was surprised to find, is actually made up of 66 books. I literally would have people say to me, hey, what book are you reading? I said, well, I'm reading the Bible. And they'd say, no, no, what book inside the book? And I would say, well, what are you talking about? They say, oh, yeah, don't you know? The Bible has 66 books or letters. Well, how would I know that if somebody didn't teach me? So I want you to know, when we start off, there's one Bible, and it's made up of 66 books. In that Bible, we're going to get the historical timeline of literally everything from before time began to how this world is going to close down when Christ returns. We're going to see the Creator's reality all the way to Christ's return. We're also going to see one Christ, one cross. You're going to realize that the cross and Christ are at the center of everything in the Bible. Christ and His cross are at the center of time. Christ and His cross is at the center of all that is reality and all that matters. And the Bible points this out very clearly. Now, that one Bible, that one Bible is in two parts. Let me show you how sophisticated this gets. Those two parts, they're made up of, ready? The old and the new. Again, why didn't somebody just tell me that? Those old and new, they're called testaments or covenants. It's the old, which means before Jesus came, and the new means after Jesus came. And those 66 books that make up our one Bible, well, there are 39 in the old part and 27 in the new part. But okay, well, I, I can follow that. Well, that's one and two. Now let's look at three. Three, like I said, there's three types of writing in these two parts of our one Bible. Let me show them to you. In the Old Testament, those three parts are, you ready? Historical writing. Then there's instruction. Some people call it wisdom. And then there's prophecy. Now, when we go over to the new part of the Bible, the New Testament, it's the exact same thing. There's history, there's instruction, and then there's prophecy. It's literally that straightforward. God is brilliant the way that he's done this. Again, I just wish somebody had told me. Now, let's go down another layer. When we go back and we look at those 39 books in the Old Testament, in the historical pool, we have 17 books. Happens to be the first 17. So if you want to read the history per the Bible, you read the first 17 books. That's the historical writing. Then we come to five in the instruction. This is where you're going to hear God in the Old Testament intentionally, directly teaching. Then we go, and there's another 17. When it comes to the prophecy and the prophets, we have 17 prophetic books. 17, 5, 17. Now let's jump over to the New Testament when Christ came. And what do we have? 
in the historical books, we have five history. When it comes to the instructions, we have 21. These are what we would tend to call letters. You may have heard the word epistles. And then prophecy, yep, we close out with one prophetic book. Do you see how the structure is coming down? It makes such sense to me. It's so clear when you see it this way. One Bible, two parts, three types of writing. And we can see how much and where those writings are. Well, let's go down one more layer as we finish out here on the structure. When you look at the Old Testament historical books, what you're going to find in those 17 is we're introduced to God's power. We're introduced to God's purpose. We're introduced to God's people. Then we see the poison that came into God's creation and people. And we don't leave this history without seeing the promise and promises of God. When we get over to the instruction, what we find next is we see Proverbs. We see the Psalms. We see poetry and forms of parallelism that God is using to instruct and teach his people. When we get over to the prophets, here we see where the word of God is focused in on the people, the problems that are coming at the people and that the people are creating, and the purity of God. Those are the emphasis. And just a side note, the prophets, these prophets that are in this writing, they all fit into parts of the uh, historical books. So next week, I'm going to show you another way of thinking about this. But if you can see where the prophet fits into the history and know who's talking about what, the Bible begins to make a whole lot more sense. And I like to think of the prophets as the newscasters of the Bible days. These prophets are the ones, like we would see today on the news, who are telling us what was going on. They were used of God to speak on his behalf to the people, thus says the Lord. And then God has used them in the Bible to tell us what was happening with the problems, with the people, and with the need for more purity. Now, when we cross over again into the time of Christ, what we see here is in the historical books. What do they focus on? Christ, Christianity, and the church. The first five books are the Gospels that tell us about Christ and the birth of Christianity in and through him, and the book of Acts, which talks about the history and the birth of the church. When we go to the next 21 letters of instructions, what we see here is God's commissioning, we see God's clarifying, and we see God's contending in these letters. That's what's happening. That's what's going on there. And when we get to the last book, Revelation, and that prophetic book in the New Testament, here what we see is a pretty chilling account of the knowing that Christ is going to return and what's going to happen in his completion. It's a very, very chilling account of the reality that is coming. Amen. I pray that as you look at this diagram, that it will help you and it will help you to help others to understand the structure of the Bible and in so doing, help you in your showing and telling. So again, here you have a tool that can be a picture, an image, but an understanding is what's most important. To be able to take the word of God on mission with you having mastered an understanding of it as the Holy Spirit empowers and then bring it to the people, whether it is to show them how and why you have and they can have such confidence in Christ, in Christianity, in the invitation to be the church, or to help to disciple and grow baby lover followers of Christ into the learners and leaders that you are discipling who will then disciple others. This is an understanding that you can transfer by taking the tools and the teaching. One Bible, two parts, three types. History, instruction, prophecy. These are things we can teach to the children or we can teach to the elders of a village. But notice, it's all built on the truth of God's word. Now, 
we're about to transition again to an equipping time for you. How do you take God's word on mission? And I want to now begin to help you to preach God's word. How do you approach the scriptures in your time of preparation as you pray and study and prepare to share? Whether it's a teaching or a preaching, there is a system that I have put together that honors God and will help to equip you because it's totally dependent on his word. And the focus is on sharing the word in a way that is honoring the truth and extending the love. I want you to watch this. And, and this, I tell you before we begin, it's a little overwhelming to try to take in. We're going to take about 20 minutes and I'm going to show you this system. Again, hold the image, the picture you'll see that you can use as a reference and then come back for further and deeper revelation and understanding. And again, our brotherhood and our leadership is here to help you. Take this in, and I want to stop intentionally after this next one to have a little bit of a deeper discussion. Watch this, and then we'll discuss how God is talking to you. It's time to study the light, study the Word of God. And here, I just, again, want to give you a little bit of a guideline, a, a way that you can come at Bible study, at light study. Max Anders, somebody that we're going to get to know quite a bit with of in the coming weeks, he has said that there are four steps to mastering the Bible in such a way that the Bible then will master you. He says it's this simple. Read the Bible. Study the Bible. Memorize the Bible. And then meditate on the Bible. Now, I have to tell you, there's a lot to be said for that. Read, study, memorize and meditate and the bible will come into you and god and his word will begin to shape you from the inside out now there's another approach to studying the bible that has gotten a quite a bit of traction i like it and i use it and i recommend it it's called inductive bible study to study the bible inductively it's a fancy word but this is simply what it means three steps it's observation what do you see in the Bible? Interpretation, what does the Bible actually mean by what it's saying? And then application. Observation, what is the Bible saying? Interpretation, what does the Bible mean by what it's saying? And then application, what am I to do with what the Bible says and means? This is the way that God would intend for you and me and everybody to study the Bible. And it can be literally that simple and straightforward. Let me just break down that a little further. In terms of observation, you want to look at terms more than words when you focus in and study a passage. And by that, what I mean, a term is a word that has been defined. Let me give you a couple of examples why this is so important that you don't just key in on words. Let me use the word trunk, for example. If I say there is a trunk, you don't know if I'm talking about the core of a tree, the front nose, if you will, of an elephant, the back of a car, or an oversized suitcase. All four of those are trunks. But when I tell you in context that I'm talking about an elephant, or I'm talking about the trunk of the apple tree, I'm talking about the trunk that's in the back of the car and not in the front of the car, or if I tell you about the trunk that held all of my old sweaters, now you know it's not just the word trunk, you know the term that I mean. In the Bible, we would see this perhaps if you look at the word love. We can see in the Bible a love between a husband and a wife. We can see a love that a brother has for a brother. And then we can see the supernatural-like love that our Lord has for the unlovely, those of us. 
three different words, three different intentions, one same translated word. So let us get to the terms. When you observe, look for the terms. You also want to look for the structure. What's going on? How is this being structured? Am I, for example, in the Proverbs where the structure is two verses together are really designed to equal one? We call them couplets. Is that the structure that I'm reading? I need to understand that. We need to take a look and see where is the emphasis being placed? Is there a tremendous amount of repetition? Think, for example, in 1 Corinthians 13. In the opening verses, nine different times we read the word love, 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 love. Well, clearly, I'm observing that this is a part of the Bible that is illuminating my understanding of love. You see what I mean? You just want to observe these things. You want to take them in. You want to understand the relationships that are going on within ideas. Is this a competing idea, this idea against that idea? Is this in a time where I'm supposed to feel a sense of jealousy or joy? What, what's going on inside the relationships in this text? Similarly, are there comparisons and contrasts? Am I supposed to look at this versus that? Or am I supposed to see how they complement one another? This is something I should observe. I should also take a look at what kind of genre. Is it poetry? Is it history? It's very important that I read history for facts and that I read poetry more for the word pictures and the illumination. That if I'm reading something that's intentionally using hyperbole, it's exaggerating on purpose, then I need to understand that and read it that way. Lastly, for observation, I just want to look at the atmosphere. Again, am I in a time of celebration in this passage, or is it a time of consequence for sin? What's the atmosphere? It will give us an understanding of what we're seeing as we observe. Now, once we've observed the passage, now we want to begin the interpretation of what we have observed. And here I want to encourage you to think about the five C's of biblical interpretation. The five C's these will really help build and develop your strategy. And they're very simple. It's just a matter of learning them and using them. So the five C's of biblical interpretation, number one, and this is by far the largest, the context. Context is king. Context is critical when it comes to proper interpretation. What's going on in the fuller context around this verse? Read the verses immediately surrounding it. Read the full paragraph that the verse or passage is in. Read the whole chapter. If need be, read the whole book. Understand the context that the truth and the light is showing you. It's coming out of a fuller context. Secondly, do the cross-referencing. See where and how this word or this account has been used elsewhere in the Bible. Let the Bible help you to properly interpret and understand what the Bible is telling you. Third, look for and understand the culture that is going on in this writing, in this passage. There are certain things that meant certain things at different times and places. If you don't understand that and you don't take it in, if you, for example, take an interpretation based on our current culture, when in reality, back in a biblical culture, something meant an altogether different thing, you're going to interpret it incorrectly. So culture is a huge part of this interpretation. Fourth, you're going to be surprised by this, I'm sure. Fourth is, you fight. ask yourself, what conclusion have I come to? I've considered the context. I've taken a look at the cross-references. I've tried to become aware of the culture. What are my own conclusions? You want to ask yourself, and you want to consider this. What, what have you concluded? Remember, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you. You have the ability to discern. Now, it doesn't mean you're always going to get it right, but you want to start here by saying, God, what have you shown me? What do I think this is? So that when you get it right and you are affirmed, that will give you a greater confidence, and you're showing yourself that you're growing. And if you later realize that you got it wrong, it's going to be God's grace that shows you where you need more refinement. So either way, by coming to your own conclusions, 
it's going to help you as you become this ambassador of light. Now, lastly, the fifth of these um, interpretation principles, the five C's, is then you want to go and get some help. You want to use a commentary. You want to consult others. And as you do, you're looking to get the affirmation and a richer understanding by those who are experts. And whether you're using a study Bible or some online tools, or, or maybe you've got a, a fairly developed library of tools, that's what's there to help you. So when it comes to interpreting what you have observed, you want to look at the context. You want to do your cross-referencing. You want to be aware of the culture. You want to ask yourself, what do I think God has shown me? And then you want to consult some others to get some expertise to just reaffirm and refine what you've taken in. Amen. So here you see again the study. We've done observation. We've now covered interpretation. The last piece is application. And let me just tell you that the whole reason why we study the Bible is for application. It's through the study of God's Word that we're praying, not just to be refreshed, but to be refined. And we bring God glory every time we take one step closer to Christ likeness. This is our goal. This is our intent. It's the doing of what God is revealing. It's the becoming of what God has exposed us to. Amen. I, I think about looking at 1 John 3.18, the verse that has inspired this entire series for me. Let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. We want to show and tell what we've studied, that we will become this very essence of Christ's likeness. We'll be his ambassadors. We'll be his aroma. We'll be his army. And as James tells us in James 1.22, that we'll be doers of the word, not just hearers, but doers of the word. Because as James also tells us, those who claim to have faith without works to back it up have themselves nothing more than dead faith. It is faith in action that is validated. It is the fruit of doing that expresses the reality of our being. Amen. Lastly, when it comes to studying, those of you that have been with us know that I like to bring it down to this simple place, especially when it comes to times of devotions, times of you sharing with somebody else, is ask yourself this, read the passage. What does it mean? What does the author mean? Secondly, how does it point to Christ and his gospel? How do you either see directly or get to Christ and his gospel through the passage that you're reading? Remember, the cross is at the center of the Bible. Jesus may not be on every page, but he's in every page. And so there is an express connection to every passage, every proclamation to Christ and his gospel. Third, ask yourself, so what does this mean for me? And fourthly, so what does this mean for everybody else? And with those answers, you're ready to help others as well. You're ready to proclaim. Remember, it was Jesus who said in John 8, 32 and 8, 36, that it is his truth that will set you free and that those that his truth has set free are free indeed. Amen. He also prayed to the Father in John 17, 17, that his truth, his word would sanctify us, that that's exactly what we need. This light is here to sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. Okay, I pray that what you're sensing now is a, a recommitment to the study of God's word, that you would recognize that God's word calls you and me to be saturated in his word, especially as those who are going to serve as servant leaders, that if you're going to shepherd, you need to study, that if you're going to shepherd, you need the scriptures. That if you're going to shepherd, those sheep that you shepherd need the scriptures. That to rightly understand the need for our Savior is to rightly understand our need for the scriptures. You see, the practical part and the practicing part of the word on mission starts personally with you in your prayer and in your preparation. And before you start to pull 
the Bible apart and put it back together again for preaching, you need to study it to rightly get with God. And study begins with your heart, not your head. Study begins with your heart, not your head. Love the truth, and then the truth will unpack that love, and you'll see them come together. Now I'm going to share with you how to prepare a sermon, how to approach the word for the express purpose of understanding it and translating it, not from Hindi to English or English to Greek or Hebrew to Swahili, but from the divine truth of God for the needing ears of the hearer. And again, what I'm about to show you crosses all cultures. This is not a American way. This is not an Indian way. This is a biblical way to share the word of God. And let me just tell you by way of preparation, it's going to be Looking at a passage, whether it is a verse or a paragraph or a chapter, it's looking at it, rightly understanding how God has put it together, digesting it in its parts so that you rightly digest it in the whole. It's going to be approaching it in a way that is taking into consideration the eyes and the ears and the heart of those that will be listening. And we understand that we may be preaching at times to lost people who don't have the ability to have the power of the Holy Spirit giving them insight. So you are the ambassador of Christ. You are the translator. You are the bridge. You are the one who can and should rightly understand the word. And you are on that mission field. You know the people that you are sharing with, either intimately or culturally. And so you prepare the meal. You take it as God has given it. And then you prepare it for the people that will hear. You're going to see there's quite a process here. But please notice. It's very, very simple when you take it in its parts. Part by part by part, we can take what is very complex and make it simple if we will use this system and stay to it. Let me show it to you, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Let me take you to an ambitious move here. I want to now take us into the fourth point. We've seen the source. We've, I pray, understood the structure. We've now been refreshed with how to study. Let me now take you to a system, a system of proclamation. And I'm going to begin by sharing with you five principles of proclamation preparation. Five principles of proclamation preparation. And then I'm going to walk you through 10 particular steps to prep you for proclamation. I pray that this will be a life-changing time. Remember, it's, it's Romans 10, 17, where we're told that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. This is so important for you, perhaps, if this is your first time. And if you're a Christian, it's so important for others. I shared with you last week, 1 Timothy 4, 16, where we're admonished and exhorted to watch ourselves and our doctrine because by doing so, we may save ourselves and our hearers. So let me take you to these principles of proclamation preparation. There are five. The first one is prayer. Second, know that there are two parts. Third, that there are three points. Fourth, that there are four priorities. And five, that there are five people that you preach and proclaim to. Let me show it to you this way. Number one, Proclamation principle number one, pray without ceasing. 
as you get ready to proclaim, as you come into the word and the light, you want to pray coming in, you want to pray while you're there, and you want to pray in preparation, and you want to pray going out, and you want to pray when you've done, as you've finished, that God will take and germinate those seeds. Preparation for proclamation, principle number one, pray without ceasing. Proclamation preparation principle number two is know that there are two parts. There's preparation and then there's proclamation. And here's the principle. Know that the scales are heavily tilted towards preparation. You want to be that person that is praying without ceasing. And you'll see momentarily that the 10 steps to this proclamation process, seven of them are preparation. As you look at this iceberg, you're going to see that the preparation process is the vast majority of work that nobody sees. In my case, on an average week, there are 20 to 25 hours of preparation for the one hour of proclamation. I've heard people say, oh, that's too much. That's way too heavy. You ought to be doing more and, and you ought to be doing different things. And I can tell you, friends, that my understanding of being an equipper of the saints, as I read my Bible, the most important thing I do as your pastor is I bring to you the fullness of God's word. I bring to you not just the facts that are in the Bible, but I pray and obey. I'm hearing and I'm heeding, and I'm bringing to you what he brings to me and what he guides me to bring to you. And as you see, I pray this is a process. It's a process that is worthy of our effort and our energy. And don't get me wrong, if I were to meet you or somebody else on the street and they, I was asked, hey, can you talk about this or you can talk about that? Yes, I can proclaim in a moment's notice. I can proclaim and preach the truth and the love of the gospel at any time and in any place. I am prepared in season and out, praise God. But when I have the opportunity to do so, I want to give God my very best so that I can give you the very best that he's revealed to me. I pray that you will see that the principle of proclamation is that the preparation needs to be significant if the proclamation hopes to be spirit-filled. Third, three points. You want to always make sure in your proclamation that God's word, God's will, and God's ways are being proclaimed. You want to do it in a way that communicates to the head, to the heart, and to the hands of your hearers. You want to do it with an intentionality of informing, inspecting, and inspiring. These three points should be principally based in all of our preparation for proclamation. Fourth, there are four priorities. Here's the bullseye. The bullseye for every proclamation. First and by far the largest is that we bring glory to God in all that we do. Second, that we communicate his truth. Third, that we do so in his real love. And fourth, that all of this is done in the construct, in the commissioning, in the contending for making disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. That's what our Lord has intended for us to do. That's the light strategy that he has for us. And fifthly, if you've been with us, you know that every time you proclaim, you're proclaiming to one or some of these five people, the lost the lovers, the learners, the leaders, and the lifers. And it's important that you take to heart who you're proclaiming to. I don't want to speak to the kindergartner the way that I do to the seminary student. And I don't want to speak to the seminary student the way that I do to the kindergartner. Understanding who you're proclaiming to or the group, because most times you're going to have a diversity and you need to be sensitive to that and proclaim in a way that is met by the least common denominator. Speak to everyone that you're speaking to. That's the principle. Amen. Okay, so now that we've seen this, let's take those principles and let's put them into application. I pray, as I now show you these 10 prep steps to proclamation, 10 prep steps to proclamation, I'm hoping here to teach you how to preach how you can take any passage in the Bible and prepare it for proclamation. 
I know many of you are going to say, hey, I don't want to preach. Listen, in the Bible, the word preach is the same word that we say proclaim. And every time you share the gospel, you're preaching, you're proclaiming, you're sharing the gospel, you're sharing God's truth and love. You're bringing God's word, God's will, and God's ways out to the people. That's the essence of show and tell. It's the essence of being a witness. It's the essence of sharing the gospel. It's the essence of making disciples. It's the essence of being the aroma of Christ. It's the essence of being a minister of reconciliation. Amen. With that said, let me walk you through these 10 steps, and then I'm going to show them to you. And I pray, again, give you a diagram that through showing and telling will help you for the rest of your life. I literally mean it when I say that after this time, you will be equipped, capable, have the potential to preach and teach the word of God in a God-honoring way to all peoples. Here are the 10 steps. First, you prayerfully pick your passage. Remember, we pray without ceasing in this process. That's a principle. If we bring those principles into these particulars. Number one is that we prayerfully pick our passage. Number two, we prayerfully identify the pivot points. You're going to see this. As you read a scripture, every time you see a, a slight variation. Let me give you an example. In John 3.16, for God, pivot. So loved pivot. The world, pivot. That he, pivot. Gave his only son, pivot. That whosoever, pivot. Believes, pivot. In him, pivot. Will have, pivot. Eternal life, pivot. You see how with the inflection in my voice, each of those places it's kind of a little subset. There's, there's, there's a, a, a thought there. there. There's something of substance of me. I call it a pivot point. So each place that you have that, you put a line. You, you create a, a separation, a pivot point. Now, third, you're going to see where these pivots really do go together. They're, they're partners. And that's where I say you're going to actually take those pivots and you're going to partner them up where there's a natural relationship. It's not a hard pivot, it's really more of a complementary one. Well, those are partners, and we're gonna actually pull them together. They're gonna to create partners. So you may have three or four or five of these pivots actually together as partners. Then we're gonna take those partners, and we're gonna create a paraphrase. Like, what do they mean? If I were to put those, those partners into one phrase, what? What would that paraphrase be? How could I say that in a different way, in my own words? Those paraphrases then are going to be collected and they're going to become your pillars. Those are the pillars of that passage. In your own words, you've now summarized down into just a few nuggets what that actually says. Now you've taken everything in and you've boiled it down to just these pillars in your own language, your own words. The next step, you're going to actually package those pillars. So in a similar way to what you did with the partners, now you go to these pillars and you say, if I were to pull those three or four pillars together, how would I package them? What would be the one way of saying that? How do they come together? And you no doubt have already guessed it. That's going to come to this punctuated point this is the big idea of the passage. That's the language you've heard at the bridge for a long, long time. That's the big idea. That's the timeless truth. When you package the pillars, you're now going to say in one pithy statement, you're going to say in one succinct way, this is what that passage really gets at. This is the big idea. I've boiled it down. It makes sense. I have the pillars, but if you put it into one statement, here it is. This is what this passage would punctuate. Here's the big idea. Now, please notice, you can see on the screen, there's a dotted line here. Those are the first seven steps. They're all preparation. That's the under the surface part of the iceberg. This is all your preparation. This is what you've done to rightly understand, 
to rightly harness the light of God's word. Now you're ready to break through the surface and you see it in number eight. Now you're ready to proclaim. This is when you've got everything boiled down and you've got it in its proper parts. So now you're going to proclaim that big idea and you're going to unpack it through its points. And ultimately in that proclamation, you're going to come to that place where what you punctuated in your preparation is what you're going to penetrate the hearts with as you sow the seeds of God's word, God's will, and God's way. So you see in this 10-step process how you can come at any passage. I have, again, I've literally, I've preached a summary of the Sermon on the Mount. I've preached entire books as a survey. I've also preached a one-word sermon, the end of our series in Acts. I preached the last word of the book of Acts, unhindered. I've preached in the book of Hebrews, a two-word series, consider him. Listen, friends, this will work anywhere and everywhere. It's a question of learning this. Let me show it to you visually now. I'm going to show it to you in a way that I pray now makes sense, and you'll see it. And when we're done in these notes with this image and in this process, I pray that you'll learn how to use this. And I'm here to help you. Praise God. It'll be my blessing to help you. Okay, let's take a look at this, the 10 prep steps for proclamation. Number one, again, you prayerfully pick your passage, represented here by the big box. Okay, so just imagine whatever you're going to look at, the Sermon on the Mount or one verse, you take the whole thing and you put it in this box. That's the whole text. That's your passage. Number two, as we talked about it, you can see here. Now, you go through that, and if you have, as I did, two words, consider him. Well, guess what? That's one pivot, consider and him. And in the one word sermon, unhindered, I had to actually get the definition, and then I use that to create my pivots so that there would be an understanding. But typically, if you're using a verse or a passage, a paragraph or half, two or three, you can see how easily you would end up going through and actually creating these pivot points. Thirdly, here you see it again. Now you create the partners. You go back and you look, which of these really do belong together? You're starting to reconstruct what you pulled apart for understanding. You can see you've got a number of partners. And as we said, this is where you're now going to see which of these partners really do go together. And how would I paraphrase what those two partners or three or four partners mean together? How would I summarize and paraphrase what those partnerships are saying? Those then become your pillars. Like we've talked about, you're going to see the pillars in your preparation become the points in your proclamation in the same way that the big idea in your preparation becomes that punctuated truth it becomes what you penetrate the soil of people's hearts with as you sow the seeds of the good news when you're done. Here, we now paraphrase the partners into the pillars. And as we said, now you're going to take all the pillars and package them into a similar paraphrase to say, what is the single punctuated point? What's the big idea? What's the timeless truth? And here again, you see it now. All of your preparation has come to this. You've taken it all in. You understand it in its parts. You've put it together where it makes sense. You've put it into your own words. You're now sharing it in a paraphrased way that you can now communicate to others and speak their language. And you've taken it down to the pillars. So now you have constructive understanding of how God put this together. And you've boiled it down to one punctuated point, one timeless truth, one big idea. Then we see the process now starts to go out. You proclaim and the big idea becomes what you now share as you proclaim. And every time you proclaim, if it's one point or if it's three or if it's eight, you're going to proclaim by illustration, explanation, and application. 
you're going to illustrate a connection to the people. Again, this is why it's important to know who you're talking to, who you're proclaiming to. You illustrate in a way that helps them understand. You unpack and explain the meaning per the author who has written this, God. And then you bring application to help the people understand what God would have them to do with that. That's the simple process. Now, that proclaiming is going to happen for each point. And again, your pillars in preparation become your points in proclamation. And each point will get that illustration, explanation, and application. Lastly, before you finish, and the way that you finish, is you bring a punctuated penetration by, again, bringing the big idea back so that you're making sure that you're depositing the seeds of understanding and the impact that is intended by our God. Amen and amen. Friends, I pray that as you see and use this illustration, that it will help you for the rest of your life. I say to you here, congratulations. You've just learned a way, a God-honoring way, to powerfully prepare for personal proclamation of God's word. And I want you to remember this, because this has always been true. It has always been true that God's word, God's spirit, and God's people, it's enough. We are plan A, and there is no plan B. God's word, God's spirit, and God's people always has been enough and always will be enough. It is what we know per the word of God that this is all we need and this is what God wants. He doesn't want us going out throwing parties. He doesn't want us going out trying to compete with the world with all the things that the world and the flesh say they want. No, he wants us to go out and show and tell the word, the will, and the ways of God. He wants us to bring the word. Let the word of God do that miraculous work of capturing people's hearts. Recognize that it's only our Lord through his word and his spirit applied and shared by his people that's going to change anybody's eternity. Again, we want to make sure that while we invite everybody to come to church, that our invitation is not to church, but it's to Christ. We pray that it is through our church that they will meet Christ. But let us not get our church in the way of Christ. Let us not let our methods interfere with our message or our mission. No, this is what our Lord has said, and this is what he means. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Ready? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped. The word of God thoroughly equips so that the men and women and children of God will be ready for every good work, they'll be equipped for every good work of righteousness that our Lord intends. Okay, so my prayer is that once again, you have received a drink from the fire hose. As we have talked, I know that these training sessions, you are receiving a lot. But know that at the end of this training time, when it's time to go back home and you're in the village, or by yourself, or gathered with another group of people. All of this is available to you now as easily as through your smartphone. Pastor Charlie and I can see your joy as you are feeding on the Word of God and learning how to feed others from the Word of God. I see your joy in your faces, and it's such a blessing. Let us transition to the last of this teaching for this session, which closes on sharing exactly what we are talking about. Friends, I pray that you get this and that your desire to share is bubbling out of you. And I pray that this equipping, this, this helping you to show and tell only inspires you to share more. Most of you know this. God calls it the Great Commission. but we're called to share. The strategy of light is ultimately to share the love and light of Christ. We know this through the Great Commission verses. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, you, Christian, go 
and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded. And tell them that I will be with them always, even to the end of the age. We know this. It's Mark 16, 15. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. Acts 1, 8, our church's founding verse. You will receive power when the Spirit comes on you, my Spirit, and you will be my witnesses locally, regionally, globally. Jesus said, John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commands. John 20, 21, here's a command. As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. Friends, we share because it's our privilege. I wonder, when was the last time you looked at 1 Peter 3.15? When was the last time you read it for impact? Listen to this verse. Honor the Christ. Honor the Christ or Messiah in your heart as Lord. Honor the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in your heart. How? Always be ready. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. You hear that? You honor Christ as Lord in your heart. You honor him as Christ and Lord in your heart when you are ready always to give an account to anyone for the hope that you have. This is showing and telling. You and I honor the Lord when we understand the source of light, the structure of light, how to study the light, a system for sharing the light, as you and I see here. Brothers, this is our great privilege and our eternal responsibility to take the word of God on mission. We have been saved to serve. We have been saved to live sent and to rightly and righteously carry the word of God on mission. Not the topical teaching, not the topical preaching, but the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the word. Sanctification comes through the truth of God's word. The hope of the world is the word of God. His name is Jesus. I pray that in this now our fourth session, that you've been encouraged and equipped. I pray that you are being blessed as you have been a blessing to me. Again, to see your hunger and your thirst. I look and I see sons. I see Timothys. I see all the potential that comes through the power and the people of the one true mighty living God. I, uh, I know we've just shared and I heard your hearts and your questions and your appreciation. I also know that it is getting late and that evening has come. I would ask if you don't mind to have Pastor Charlie one more time pray with us and for us. You have heard my love and my prayers. It's a blessing that Pastor Charlie is with us now as well. And I promise you, his love and his prayers have been with you as well. Let us ask him, if you would, Pastor Charlie, to close us for this session. I'm so grateful to be here and to hear this. Uh, Pastor Jeff has shared this with me and our brothers and sisters back home. But to hear it again just really inspires me and to see your enthusiasm and desire that God has placed you in that corner of the universe, that part of the world, to take the word. And one thing Pastor Jeff said today that really hit me, no matter what culture, no matter what language, it's the same answer. His name is Jesus and we get to proclaim him who is the word. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you so much, Father, how you poured into us through Pastor Jeff's study and desire to make disciples that will go out and make disciples. Father, we pray and we know that your word never goes out in vain. And Father, that 
eternity has been impacted today because in our hearts, we've learned in preparation to pray, to truly pray, and Father, to, to go out and then share what you laid on our hearts. And now we have found a way, a mechanism that is the, the, the way and style how to hold God's word into a message and to take it to others. Thank you so much for this time. Be with our brothers. Keep them strong in you, Lord. Protect them and guide them. And may the, their time together be so special as they come from different parts of India and come together this week. Lord, may they just truly enjoy the, the fellowship, the relaxation, the love. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Our love is with you, brothers. Rest well and come ready and hungry again for the next session. Mm -hmm.